Hello, BookTube. We're continuing with my completely pointless library tour, and we are uh, on to a canonical bookcase, a classics bookcase. So I guess I should offer the same kind of warning that I did for the romance bookcase. Right? I mean, we haven't needed that warning for most of this little book room because everything's all munched together. But for the romance bookcase, I, I gave a, a prefatory note ahead of time saying to anybody who's watching that the whole video is going to be romance novels. So if, you don't, if you're not interested in that, then you're not going to be interested in this video. I suppose I should do the same thing here because this is all canonical classics. This is all Eastern and Western classics. So if you're not interested in those, that's what this whole video, that's what this whole next week of videos will be. So uh, just a little warning there. Now we're going to continue. The, we are doing a bunch of mass market paperbacks here because of the arrangement of this particular shelf. There's a top shelf to the bookcase right at clavicle level. And then set off from that halfway back, there is a smaller half shelf that is perfect size to put mass market paperbacks on. But it means that I've got two sort of stepped layers, uh, which means that hardcovers won't work in any case here in the front or in the back. Uh, so let's just let's just go on here. Now we're going to have a lot of Bantam and Signet classic, old Bantam and Signet mass market paperback classics. We're going to have a lot of those. Like for instance, here's a Bantam classic of the Bostonians. By Henry James. Now we're going to do this for Feng Shui. I think the Feng Shui will work itself out. Here's a Bantam classic of the Deer Slayer. Wish I could find these. Uh, Bantam did a whole bunch of Cooper. I wish I could find all of them and in considerably better condition than this. I will, sooner or later. Although, as I've mentioned many times before, there was only a limited number of these mass market paperbacks made. It was a huge number, but it was a limited number. They aren't made anymore. Mass market paperbacks just in general, except for a few genres, aren't made anymore. And only a tiny handful of mass market classics. We, the world will never see another mass market paperback of James Fenimore Cooper. There's only a limited number of those things out there in the world. So what I really should have done was 25 years ago when they were everywhere in used bookstores. I should have got them all and kept them all. Instead, I got them all and got rid of them all. Uh, anyway, we, then we have uh, an old Signet classic of Crime and Punishment. This is the Sidney Monas translation. That great weird cover. Uh, we have the Burton Raffle. Beowulf, which I mentioned yesterday, uh, Micah Cummins and I are doing uh, a buddy read. We've, we've been doing a buddy read for a few months now, and it's been a lot of fun. So we, And it's a forward-facing thing. We're not just keeping it to ourselves on Voxer. So you're welcome to join in. And for April, Micah, I'm very happy to learn that Micah liked my idea of reading Beowulf in April. And Beowulf is 80 pages long. So what we're going to do is read a different translation of Beowulf every week. <laughs> we're going to start with... Uh, J.R. Tolkien's translation. Then we'll move on to uh, Penguin Classics, which we've already seen. And then we'll move to this, the Burton Raffle translation that sold like griddle cakes. And then we'll move on to the Seamus Heaney translation of Beowulf, which sold like mega griddle cakes. <laughs> and that will still leave us one week. And I, I'm, I think we'll, we'll probably read John Gardner's brief novel, Grendel. I think that would be a lot of fun. Uh, let's see here. We'll move, let's just keep going here. Can't have too many digressions. Uh, this is a big Oxford World there, This uh, The whole top shelf here almost is all Oxford World Classics. This is the Oxford World Classics of Vanity Fair. All the soldiers off to Waterloo. <laughs> and this is uh, this has uh, illustrations all throughout. Uh, this is a beautiful condition, Vanity Fair. It's not... It's it's. I worry about these things. I have it, and I would read it in a pinch, but I worry about it falling apart on me. And then we have the Oxford World Classics. Oxford World Classics did a, a whole run of Anthony Trollope for the centenary. And uh, they were great. An absolutely great production. It was ins I used to have them all and doubles and triples of all of them. And a insanity ensued and I got rid of them. So now I grab them whenever I see them. Uh, this is Mr. Scarborough's family. Uh, we did a... Uh, Read along of that, I believe, on this channel, and really enjoyed it. We, here is John Caldicate, which we've never done a read along of on this channel. These are great, not only for their notes, but also for their introductions. They're just a wonderful, sturdy thing. Here's Bramley Parsonage, uh, getting ready to go out fox hunting. There we have uh, Barchester Towers, which was by far the uh, the number one. <laughs> this is the bookmark. Books are bewitching. <laughs> this was by far the number one request back a, last year. Micah Cummins and Mark at Book Time with Elvis and I, we did a read aloud of The Warden by Anthony Trollope. And uh, 
We also did a read aloud of Dracula. I had a great amount of fun. It's been enormous amounts of trouble, like getting cats to march in parade. It's been an enormous amount of trouble getting them to do another read aloud. But this was from you, this to me, this was the number one requested thing. Could you please follow up the warden with a read aloud of Barchester Towers? That would be a lot of fun. Uh, then we have uh, one of my favorite Trollope novels, The Prime Minister. This thing has seen better days. This is the copy that I always go back to. It is battered. Then we have uh, a book that Trollope should not have written. This is his autobiography. How wonderful that, that Oxford gave it. Such a wonderful volume. A new introduction. Tons and tons of notes in here. Just wonderful. But Trollope shouldn't have written it. It completely dispelled the myth of the author. In particular. Him in particular as an author. Where he's writing about how many pages I wrote per day, and this is how little I thought about it, and then when I was done with those pages, I went and had a big five-course breakfast, then I went out to work, and then I had a spot of fox hunting, then I came back, and I had more work to do, so I pulled those pages out and wrote another five pages, and people read it and thought, you sound like a cloth merchant. <laughs> this one, I was enchanted by your novels, and this is the process that generated them. I wish, I wish in retrospect, that he hadn't written, or that it hadn't been published, it was published posthumously. I wish that it had never been written. Uh, then we have The Claverlings by Anthony Trollope. Really a classic Trollope novel. It and, and uh, Tranley Parsonage are really classic Trollope novels. Then we have a very beaten up copy of The Way We Live Now. I have read this so many times <laughs> in this copy and in all sorts of other copies. And thankfully now I, you know, now I, I can read a book on my iPad, a book that is an electronic file. It's indestructible. I don't need to keep reinforcing it. I don't have to listen to the spine creak when I'm reading it. I don't have to do anything like that. Uh, thankfully, I, I've got sort of an ur text that I don't need to worry about anymore. Then we have The Small House at Arlington, uh, which starts off with the very commonsensical observation that if there's a small house at Arlington, it follows there must be a large house at Arlington. <laughs> we have Dr. Thorne. A lot of you may have seen a recent TV adaptation of Dr. Thorne, uh, which has... Trollope is often is often considered this big, beefy, red-faced, you know, uh, fox-hunting, imperialist English author. But uh, Doctor Thorne is one of the many novels, like the like Barchester Towers, that shows that when he wants to do comedy, he can do it very, very well. I would argue far better than Dickens, far better because it's less slapstick. Although the, 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 the most funny thing in Dr. Thorne is a bit of slapstick, but uh, anyway. Actually, the most funny thing in Barchester Towers is also a bit of slapstick. I'm still right. <laughs> uh, then we have The American Senator, uh, which is a kind of a strange novel. Uh, I, we've commented many times before when we've done Trollope read-alongs on this channel, which I know, I know, we haven't done anyone in a while, I know that. <laughs> uh, but when we've done them on this channel... One of the things that's cropped up over and over again, we used to do them all the time, fill a whole year with Trollope, was uh, how good he is at his standout female characters. Sometimes he gets really sappy and saccharine with them, but sometimes he writes a, just a three-dimensional, lovable and hateable female character, and there is one in The American Senator that the book should have her name as its title, and she's by far the most memorable thing. In the, the American senator, the eponymous American senator, is not all that important to the book. Uh, oh, okay, then we have, uh, this is has an introduction in the, and edits by Hermione Lee, the great biographer, and this is The Duke's Children in Oxford World Classics, which, as you can see, I have read this a million times. I've reinforced it a million times. It's just about ready to fall apart. And uh, I can let it fall apart, because... Uh, an, an editorial team went through the the drafts of this original book when Trollope wrote this for serialization the way he did most of his books. And uh, when it came time for that serialization to be put into a book form, his editors asked him to make huge cuts, and he did. And uh, an editorial team went to those periodicals and assembled the full text of The Duke's Children. And that is now in, I think, uh, we'll, we'll get to it, I think it's in Modern Library. This is not the whole of the book. And so I, I don't I don't know if if it came time for me to reread the Duke's Children, which never I never need much urging to do. I don't think I would go back to that to that version, to this version or the one in Penguin Classics. I think I would go to the other one. Oh no, the one in Penguin Classics is the is the abridged uh, the unabridged one. Uh, then we have uh, the Last Chronicle of Barset. This is edited by Stephen Gill, a huge thing that uh, that takes us uh, Barchester Towers. It was the second book in the series and the most popular one. And this says goodbye to all of these characters in Plumstead Episcopi. Uh, 
Then we have, uh, okay, non trollop We have an Oxford World Classic of the Red and the Black. This is translated by Catherine Slater. Uh, and then we have an anthology volume from Oxford. This is the Anglo-Saxon World. And this has a complete translation of Beowulf. <laughs> so I don't know how many translations of Beowulf are in this room, or even in this bookcase. I think there are at least four translations of Beowulf on this bookcase alone. So this is Kevin Crossley Holland does the translation of Beowulf that is complete in this book, along with uh, other things. Then we have the Oxford Bede, Ecclesiastical, Ecclesiastical History of the, of the uh, English People. This is a translation by uh, uh, well, edited with an introduction by Judith McClure and Roger Collins. Uh, okay, so one of them must have done the translating duties and they're just being coy about it. Uh, then we have the last of the Oxfords here. This is the Poems of Propertius, the great Roman poet, the minor Roman poet, the great minor Roman poet of Propertius. These are translated by Guy Lee with tons and tons of, uh, of notes in the back. Then we have a, a repeat. We've already seen this. This is the Signet Hamlet. The Signet uh, Shakespeare is a really good volumes. I had this forever and ever, but I don't. Uh, Counterpoint Records and Jazz in Hollywood, California. <laughs> uh, anybody know if that still exists? Is that still there? <laughs> uh, I don't know that I would go back to this now that I have that, uh, that hardcover that we saw yesterday. Then we have uh, a signet classic of Milton. This is Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained. I have another mass market of Milton somewhere that is uh, Paradise Lost and Lycidas and Samson Agonistes. But this is Paradise, Re Paradise Lost and Paradise Regained. In a rather, rather nice looking thing that I never see anymore. This is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Once upon a time, you saw paperbacks like this all the time. First, they were a dollar a piece. Then, the, the, as the people were less and less interested in them, they were three for a dollar. Then, sometimes there was a shop here in Boston that for years had mass market paperbacks for five for a dollar. And if I could go back in time or re inhabit my body from back then, I would get them all. I <laughs> would just get them all and put them in a chest somewhere. Uh, oh, all right. Well, these aren't exactly canonical classics, but I'm still going to title the video that way. This, these are the old BBC covers for I, Claudius, and Claudius the God. Uh, Robert Graves' seminal books uh, that were made into a great BBC adaptation. Um, Anne Novella and I have, uh, have thought about doing an I, Claudius read-along uh, called We, Claudius. And what I would really like is a large number of co-hosts for that. If you are a booktuber who regularly makes videos and you're at all interested in that, let me know. I would love to, to get a nice big crowd of co-hosts for We Claudius. That would be a lot of fun. Uh, then we have another Viking Portable. We saw a bunch of those yesterday. This is the Viking Portable Victorian Reader. Victorian row house there, and there's the Queen. <laughs> and this has a whole bunch of stuff. What does this have? Charlotte Bronte, Samuel Butler, Thomas Carlyle, Charles Darwin, Charles Dickens, George Eliot. Uh, is Trollope in here? Yes, he is, and Oscar Wilde, and a score of others, including the Queen herself, probably excerpts from her Highland Diary. And then the last of the Viking portables, this is the portable Johnson and Boswell, which will have not only lots of excerpts from uh, the life of Johnson, but also uh, all the other adventures that they had together that Boswell wrote up. Uh, not in very good condition, but I never see it, ever, so I might as well have it. Uh, and let's continue here. We've got, we're, do, we're doing fine. This is uh, an old Bantam classic, The Heart of Darkness and the Secret Sharer. Uh, so we're just going to try to slip this in there without hitting the camera. We have the old Signet classic of uh, Innocence Abroad, which is one of my favorite Mark Twain books, uh, with a sales receipt in it. 60 Cents, 1979. Is that right? Am I reading that right? Well... Uh, these are ur texts in a way. I have all of the, all of these things are available on Project Gutenberg, and I have these mass market paperbacks because they bring back fond memories, and I have this shelf for them, and I have the Penguin Classics. But I also, as you're going to see, I have full dress, actual hardcovers and large size paperbacks of all of these as well in different formats, not just the uniform ones. And we have, uh, the Bantam Classic of Return of the Native. Uh, Thomas Hardy is not liberally represented in my classics, but he is there. We have uh, Ernest Hemingway, the Nick Adams stories, original cover artwork there. Uh, we have uh, The Idiot, 
by Dostoevsky. This is a translation by... Sometimes these old paperbacks don't even tell you. <laughs> they don't even mention. Because this is the Crossus Garnet translation of The Idiot. Uh, we have The House of Seven Gables. Uh, Nathaniel Hoffman. With one light on in the house. <laughs> uh, which is which still exists. You can still go and, and do the, a tourist attraction. It's still a tourist attraction there. The, an old friend of mine used to say uh, that the the residents <laughs> all around the House of the Seven Gables are so bored with tourists who come by and say, can you tell us where the House of the Seven Gables is? They just point and say, it's the House with the Seven Gables. <laughs> uh, then we have an old, an old bantam of, of mice and men. This sold like hotcakes when it came out in this mass market paperback format because it went into school. Uh, we have the bantam classics, the complete short stories of Mark Twain. Delightful thing. Happy to have this. Uh, again, I'm not sure how well any of these things would stand up to an actual reading. Sooner or later, I should probably try that. The Oxfords would handle it quite well. They have. The, the Way We Live Now and, and uh, The Duke's Children, I've read many times in those exact paperbacks. But some of these others, some of these bantams and signets, they might be a little too stiff. Uh, we have this bantam uh, classic of Moby Dick. With no whaling, no killing of a whale on the cover, no ship, no nothing. Just an ominous oceanscape. Very good. Uh, and, so, and this has a American Classics bookmark. Uh, Melville is on there with Hawthorne and Faulkner and Edith Wharton uh, and uh, I guess that's shows that I've been using that book and we have uh, a bantam classic of the Hunchback of Notre Dame there's Dom Claude Froyo <laughs> there on the cover who is the translator here this is translated and abridged by Lowell Bear so although this cover has sentimental attraction for me I doubt I would go back to this because it's abridged uh, I I just haven't found, I know the, the exact version of, of Notre Dame de Paris or the Hunchback of Notre Dame. I know the exact version that I want. Uh, it's from mid 20th century. I wonder if any of you could, could guess which one it is. I, have, I, I know the exact edition that I want and it is not abridged. I just haven't found it yet, that's all. Uh, then we have uh, Jack London. Just found a big fat volume of Jack London yesterday. This is The Call of the Wild and White Fang. Again, in one of these old Bantam classics. Then we have a Bantam classic of Nicholas Nickleby. Uh, they did a lot of of Dickens, and I have barely any of it. Uh, this is in perfect condition, like the day it was made. We have the old Signet classic of Northanger Abbey. Uh, we have an old Signet classic, much read, much reread. Oh God, <laughs> this is in such rough shape. Of uh, Idols of the King, uh, by Tennyson, oh, which is uh, really, really good. It's a shame that T Tennyson, like so many tentpole Victorians, appears to be permanently out of favor. No one reads Browning. No one reads Kipling, of course. No one's allowed to read Kipling. No one reads Tennyson anymore. It's a little bit weird to me. And Trollope. I mean, Trollope has his ardent supporters. I'm one of them, but he isn't read popularly anymore. Now, then we have the tiny little signet uh, Bantam classic of uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, just a cute little thing that I think I got for free. We have a Bantam classic of Walden and Other Writings by Henry David Thoreau. I have quite a bit of Thoreau in this room. Uh, this one has been much used. Here's another Jack London. The Sea Wolf. This and Call of the Wild and White Fang are all in that big paperback that I found yesterday. Uh, we have the big Bantam uh, of Anna Karenin. I believe this is also Constance Garnet. Uh, no, this is a new translation by Joel Carmichael. And here you have a badly sun-faded cover. The cover does not look like that. It, it's very bright and vibrant. We have a tiny little Bantam classic of Candide uh, by Voltaire, who's the translator here. Lowell Bear. It's the translator. Uh, we have a Bantam classic of Gulliver's Travels and other writings. Uh, so you have uh, Taylor Tub and A Modest Proposal. A bunch of other things will be in here. But this is this is also all of Gulliver's Travels. We have more Robert Louis Stevenson. This is Kidnapped. Uh, we have uh, another Thomas Hardy. Oh, my. I didn't think I had two of these. This is Far From the Madding Crowd. So I have... I have Return of the Native and Far From the Madding Crowd. Fantastic. Oh, <laughs> it's another Thomas Hardy. Good Lord, this is Jude the Obscure. All right, so I've got three of those in the Bantams. Then we have some uh, Mark Twain. We have The Adventures of, of Tom Sawyer. So this is another Tom Sawyer. We've already seen one on this little half shelf. Here's another one. And then The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. I grabbed this because the cover artwork here is the theatrical release poster for the Broadway musical Big River, which I love. <laughs> I absolutely love. 
Uh, <laughs> I will not sing River in the Rain, but I feel like doing that. <laughs> this is, uh, this is just, it's, it's uneven. Uh, like most Broadway shows are. It's uneven. There are some songs in it that are just a waste of time. But there are others that are amazingly good. Just amazingly good. Big River, the showpiece of the show, is great. Uh, and there are others. There's one song in here that is so incredibly tender. <laughs> it's just so incredibly sweet. Uh, it doesn't belong in the Huck Finn story, but I don't care. <laughs> I don't care at all. Uh, then we have this thing. This is the a Bantam Classic of the Three Musketeers. This says complete and unabridged, but of course it is abridged. <laughs> and this is a translation, again, by Lowell Bear. I guess Lowell Bear had a, a standing gig with Bantam. Uh, I love a Man with a Glove there. I love the cover. Uh, but this, I would use the Lawrence Ellsworth translation, which we're going to see. It's on this bookcase. A lot of these things are duplicated elsewhere on this bookcase. Here we have 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Again, like with, uh, with Moby Dick, I find this cover incredibly refreshing because it has no depiction of the nautilus it has no giant octopus it has no no divers no vision of atlantis no nothing like that it's just just that uh then we have some melville this is uh billy bud and other stories somewhat boring cover and then we finish up with david copperfield but uh we've already seen i, I found this and uh I don't want this volume. This volume is in really rough shape, and I found a perfectly new volume. <laughs> exact same thing. I don't need two of them on this bookcase. Uh, and there you go. 21 minutes to get us through two shelves of mass market paperbacks. So we will move on uh, next time to this next shelf. Oh my god. The next shelf is going to be a logistical challenge. Uh, because it's going, to mean, it's going to mean moving Lord Ganesha. How's that going to work? <laughs> it never works out well. <laughs> well, anyway, I'm going to put everything back on this shelf and, and order it and neaten it a little, and then we'll move on to the next one next time. <laughs> so I'll see you then. Thank you, BookTube.